Now let's discuss HIV. Remember that HIV has a diploid genome. There's two molecules of RNA that are identical. There are also several clinically important proteins that you need to know that are associated with HIV. For example, P24 is a capsid protein. GP41 and GP120 are both on the surface of HIV. GP41 is involved in fusion and entry into the cell. And GP120 is involved in attachment to the host T cell. Reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that's encoded by the genome. This synthesizes double-stranded DNA from RNA, and then the double-stranded DNA will then integrate into the host genome. The three structural protein genes that you need to know are OMV, which is GP120, and GP41. The gene itself is called OMV. The gene GAG encodes P24, and the gene POL encodes reverse transcriptase. Remember that the virus binds to CXCR4 and CD4 on T cells or CCR5 and CD4 on macrophages. Those in the population that have homozygous CCR5 mutations are actually immune to infection by HIV. If you have a heterozygous CCR5 mutation, you actually end up with a slower course of the virus. HIV diagnosis is a two-step process. First, there's a presumptive diagnosis made with an ELISA test. This is a sensitive test, has a high false positive rate and a low threshold, so it's a rule out test. It's used to screen for HIV. The positive results for the ELISA test are then confirmed with a Western blood assay. This is more specific, has a high false negative rate and a high threshold, so it's a rule in test. So we always do the ELISA first and then confirm with the Western blot. That way we avoid as many false positive and false negatives as we can. The HIV PCR and viral load tests are increasing in popularity and becoming more and more used. They allow the physician to monitor the effect of drug therapy on the viral load as well as used diagnostically. AIDS diagnosis is actually diagnosed when there are less than or equal to 200 CD4 positive T cells in a person's serum. A normal person's serum contains about 500 to 1500 CD4 T cells. The label of AIDS is also given to HIV-positive individuals that have an indicator condition, such as pneumocystis pneumonia, or a CD4 to CD8 ratio less than 1.5. So again, reminder, ELISA Western blot tests look for antibodies to viral proteins. These tests are often falsely negative in the first one to two months of HIV infection and can be falsely positive initially in babies born to infected mothers because they look at the GP120 and there are anti-GP120 IgG antibodies that cross the placenta. In looking at the time course of HIV infection, there are four stages, and we call these the four Fs. There's flu-like or the acute stage, feeling fine or the latent stage, falling count, and final crisis. So in looking at the acute phase, the stage one, we have acute symptoms, the flu-like symptoms, the prodromal, fever, malaise, typical viral type symptoms. During this time, we have high CD4 lymphocyte counts and high viral titer counts as measured by P24 antigen. As we move from acute to latent phase, we see a stable CD4 count. We see the rise of anti-P24 and anti-GP120 antibodies, and we see the decline of actual virus within the serum, so a decline in the P24 antigen. This latent phase can last weeks, months, or even years. During the third phase of the falling count, what we see is the falling CD4 levels. As the CD4 levels drop off, we see a drop off in antibody levels and a rise again in the viral titers. During this phase, we start to see more opportunistic infections and more malignancies until we get to that fourth phase, the final crisis phase, in which the CD4 lymphocytes totally drop off and the antibodies totally drop off and the virus rises to titers higher than we see even in the acute phase of the infection. So there are various opportunistic infections that we associate with AIDS and that we will look for not only in clinic but for you on the boards to indicate what might be an HIV infection. We can talk about this depending on the organ system. So in the brain what we see are infections like cryptococcal meningitis, toxoplasmosis, CMV encephalopathy, AIDS dementia, 
and the appearance of PML through the JC virus, which would indicate the falling levels of CD4s again and the onset of what we would call AIDS. In the eyes, we can see CMV retinitis. In the mouth, we see thrush caused by candida albicans. We can see herpes, we can see CMV, and we can see oral hairy leukoplakia caused by Epstein-Barr virus. In the lungs, we see pneumocystis pneumonia. We formerly knew this as PCP or pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. It's now called pneumocystis gyrovesi pneumonia. We also see TB as well as histoplasmosis. In the gastrointestinal tract, we see cryptosporidiosis. We see Mycobacterium avium intracellulari complex or MAC complex infections. We see CMV colitis. We see non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, again caused by Epstein-Barr virus and we see the appearance of isospora belly infections. In the skin, we see reappearances of shingles caused by BZV and Kaposi sarcoma caused by HHV8. In the genitals, we see genital herpes, warts, and cervical cancer in women caused by HPV. Virologists and infectious disease doctors often use CD4 levels in HIV-positive individuals to determine prophylactic therapies according to which opportunistic infections are seen at certain levels of CD4 accounts. For example, the CD4 levels dropping below 400 then increase risk of oral thrush, tinea pedis, reactivation BZV or shingles, reactivation tuberculosis, and other bacterial infections such as H. flu, strep pneumo, and salmonella. Once the CD4 levels drop below 200, then we start to see reactivation of herpes simplex virus. We see cryptosporidiosis, isospore development, disseminated coccidiomycosis, and pneumocystis pneumonia. As the levels continue to drop and we get below 50, we see CMV retinitis and esophagitis, we see disseminated MAC complex infection, and we see cryptococcal meningoencephalitis. There are also neoplasms associated with HIV. We've mentioned Kaposi sarcoma caused by HHV8. We see invasive cervical carcinoma caused by HPV, and we see primary CNS lymphomas as well as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. HIV encephalitis often occurs late in the course of HIV infection and is used in order on the boards to show a late type of AIDS picture. The virus gains CNS access via infected macrophages. Then we have microglial nodules with multinucleated giant cells seen in the brain. And that concludes this section of the review.